Welcome back to the show today. Today, we have an incredible guest who's here to share his inspiring story of launching a cash-based physical therapy practice and achieving remarkable results in record time. In just 11 weeks, he's managed to bring in $18,000, proving that with the right mindset, strategy, systems, and hustle, you can truly defy expectations and thrive in this unique business model. We're going to dive deep into how he did it by covering the steps he took, the challenges he faced, and the key strategies that helped him hit these impressive numbers so quickly. Whether you're a new grad, a seasoned PT, or someone considering the leap into a cash-based physical therapy model, this episode is packed with insights you won't want to miss. So grab a notebook, get comfortable, and get ready to be inspired. Let's welcome Tommy V to the show. What's up, guys? I'm Dr. Tommy V. I'm doctor of physical therapy. Before that, I did athletic training school. I got both my degrees from the University of North Florida up in Jacksonville. Jacksonville is my hometown. Same from Jacksonville, we say Duval. For the Jacksonville Jaguars, we're the only, we're the most popular county in the nation. It makes no sense, but uh, yeah, that's where I'm from. And uh, through a, through a winding journey of uh, graduating PT school, working in the hospital during COVID, which absolutely sucked. All the vaccine mandates, people getting fired, people losing their license, all kind of crazy stuff. Uh, we moved into a camper, went on the road, did travel contracts. We did travel contracts for about 15 months. We went throughout Florida, Kentucky. South Carolina, did some time with the U.S. Tennis Association, working pro tennis tournaments, flying all over the country. And then we found out we we're having our second daughter last year. And we know that we, with two kids, we could not be in a camper anymore or I would end up divorced with just me and the dog. So we uh, opted to move down to Clearwater, Florida, which is where we are now. We moved here when my wife was quite pregnant. And so we, so I quickly just got the highest paying job that I could find. And as we were making that transition, that's when I crossed paths with Brandon and found his home health mentor course, how I was able to make six figures as a home health physical therapist. This was very, was very enticing because moving to the Tampa Clearwater area is very saturated. When I was in Kentucky, there's only three PT schools in all of Kentucky. So there's not a lot of physical therapists. So you can get very well-paying jobs there. Here in Florida, there's, when I looked, there was 23. Over half of them are private and they crank out 30 to 90 graduates three times a year. So the Florida market is very saturated, especially Tampa. And so I did, I filled out 35 job applications in every setting, hospital, SNF, outpatient, inpatient rehab from all over Tampa, towards the water, more in the city. And I did 15 interviews and got 12 job offers. And the pay ranges were from $27 an hour to $34 an hour. And I said, okay, as the single income earner, because my wife's about to have the baby and do pregnancy stuff, that's not going to work, especially not down in this market with the way housing and inflation and things are. I knew that was not going to work. So using Brandon's home health course, I was able to negotiate my way to a home health job, those $63 a point, which quickly got me, I think base pay was in the 90 Ks. And then of course, if you go over your points, you can get more money. So I was able to secure a six figure job um, with no home health experience. I was able to sit down with the executive director and because of the program, I knew about the Oasis, the starter cares and points and all that stuff. That helped me secure a well-paying job that had benefits to make sure I was able to take care of my family. Uh, as we moved through last year, our daughter was born a little early and she spent 26 days in the NICU. And that's when I had to take a hard look in the mirror where I was unable to take time off from work because I used up all my PTO. So I had to go to work with my new baby in the hospital, my two-year-old at her grandparents' house, my wife's parents' house. And then my wife at the hospital with our new baby and I was out having to drive around and see home health patients. And that sucked. That absolutely sucked big time. Not being able to be there for my family on my terms and have someone else dictate my time was miserable. Every single day I woke up and was extremely frustrated. And that really started that. That was the catalyst that started to say, okay, I'm not doing this forever. I'm going to be doing my own thing before long. The question I had for you was, do you feel you didn't go to school to be a DBT that have your time controlled and be scope and salary capped? 
Yeah, not at all. So when I went to athletic training school and I was in the sports medicine world, which is all about performance, healthy living, nutrition, helping people meet their goals, really good programming and exercise, really using exercise to keep people off of medications. When I applied to physical therapy school, I thought I was going to be moving myself further down that path and gaining additional skills in that same direction. And then with my doctor of physical therapy said, hey, I'll have autonomous practice so I can do my own thing. I can help people really reach their goals, move their best, all these things. But then when I got in PT school, I only had two ortho classes my whole time. I had less time in education specific to ortho and exercise than my entire athletic training undergraduate degree. And furthermore, 63% of physical therapists go into outpatient ortho. So in a three-year program, I only got two ortho percent of the ortho world. It completely blew my mind. And I was extremely frustrated the entire time in therapy school because I would ask real world questions of, hey, so if we're going to have a clinic, we're going to have therapists on our staff and we're going to be serving clients in the community, what does that look like? And I would ask very business or financial questions in school. And I was constantly harassed and dismissed I had to go to a parent teacher conference with a professor because they said that, like I was being disrespectful to the model. And wait, I wait, just wait, wait, wait. It was it the, the professor's parents or yours? Oh, I say a parent say a parent teacher conference. It was me being the professor and then our program director. Oh, okay. Um, I had so to go to uh I want to clarify yeah. that for a second. Yeah. All right. Yeah. They said that I was uh, that I was full of so much potential, but that I asked too many questions and that because I had my athletic training as my undergrad that I came in, like I knew everything and I was asking a lot of questions and they didn't like that. And they didn't like that I was business minded because at this point I had already gotten into real estate and so understand like how business and money and how you need those things. And so, yeah, it was, it was a bumpy ride. And so when I got out of school, I thought I would just be able to just go do my own thing. And that is very quickly not the case. Physical so, therapy school does not equip you to run a clinic or be a business owner. Whether you do insurance or cash, it doesn't prepare you for either path. It only trains you how to be an employee and check a box and do whatever the government and insurance and your corporate mill tells you to do. That's all it means you to do. All right. Two things. One, if you don't remember, Tom, this is Thomas's second appearance on the show. We did a real estate one with him a while ago. He was successful in real estate before going to the PT school. I do recommend you check out the episode to get more of his real estate background. Now we're talking about what motivated him to go into the cash-based world and we're just going to cover everything. I just going to cover his background and motivation. I think at this point, you realize that your daughter, was she in the NICU? Right? Yeah, she was in the NICU for 26 days. Yeah. And so every day, I was yeah. like, fuck this job. I would literally go to the hospital like 5 a.m., feed through a morning bottle in my scrubs, and then go to home health and help all these old people that don't give a shit about their health. And then I'll come back to the hospital after work. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is absolutely miserable. Yeah. So that was probably your primary motivation to be like, I need to build my own income stream. But also, what I want to make clear is I think you knew this was possible because you were successful in real estate before you went to PT school. So you knew that you could build an income stream regardless of what it was. Does that make sense? Yes. The idea of running my own business was always in my in the back of my head. I was very blessed that my first job as an athletic trainer, and then I did my clinicals as a PT, and then my first job as a PT right out of school just for a few months was a private practice, insurance-based practice that was very ingrained and established in the high school sports community back home where I lived. So they had contracts with 15 high schools and middle schools throughout Clay County. And so the concept of providing value to the community and running a business and having a network of referrals, I was, had a high level of exposure going out and marketing to parents, athletic directors, mead physicians in the community. Like I had some experience doing those things. Um, and so I felt equipped that, hey, I already know how this works. Definitely can work. And so that's where some of that started. Okay. 
So now that we've got your background and motivation, anything else on background motivation you want to say to anybody before we move forward? Because I know there's some stuff you didn't share last time and you may want to share or you can save that another, another time. The, the biggest thing is that when you think about student loans, is that no one's coming to pay off your student loans. No one's coming to save you. The government is never going to come and pay off your student loans. Neither's magic things, not just going to make them go away. Like you are on the hook for your student loans. And so the quicker that you realize, shit, I got to make a plan to attack these, the better off you'll be. I was able to figure this out about uh, 10 or so years ago. Uh, we lost my dad to cancer in 2013. And losing my dad just made me realize how fragile and short life is. And I have no rich relatives or inheritance or anything coming for me. Everything that I want in my life is going to be made by me or it's not going to happen. And so I was able to learn that about 10 years ago. And that has further been motivation of the only person that's going to help me and my family is me. There's no outside help. No government's going to help me. There's not family money going to trickle down. I'm not going to win the lottery. I'm not counting on any of that stuff. I have to build a business by providing value to the market. And that's going to be our path out. And that's something to do with, with myself. Some of you guys know I lost both my parents before I was like 20 years old. And I'll tell you when that happened, I was 1920. It's one of these things where I thought people should feel sorry for me because I guess my brain isn't fully developed because I'm developed here 25 or something like that. But, uh, but back then, you can play the victim card as a male. They didn't give a fuck about this, about, about young men. It might be different today. They might tell you to, to change your gender, right? But that being said, I think with where we're at right now, it's something where sometimes you need a catalyst like that to understand that nobody's coming to save you, especially if you're a male listening to this podcast. If you're depressed, you're burnt out, you don't know what to do, it's probably because you're not making enough money to provide for yourself and your family. And the fastest way to do that is to actually start your own business. Even on the side, they may pick up PRN. You can even see with Thomas and myself, we actually both made 100K in home health before even starting businesses. And it's something where that might be what you need to do. But I want to say a lot of the young male listeners out there listening to this and don't know what to do. I want you to understand that nobody's coming to save you. Nobody gives a single fuck about you when you have no value to others. Even other male friends that you may have had your whole life, when you provide zero value to them, they're going to leave you. It's why a lot of older dudes end up alone because they don't have social networks. They don't have friends. And that's something where, you know, if you can build a life for yourself, where you're able to provide yourself your family, you're going to be a lot happier. And you can see Tommy was burnt out by not being able to be there for his daughter. and he realized even though he was at the 90 to 100k mark he needed to do more to get more control of his time so taking it back around the biggest thing we tell a lot of beginners is if you're burnt out and outpatient 80, 80 hours every two weeks 40 hours every week on your time back usually what you need to do is usually leave that job i know it's a bit of safety net but cut to cut those handcuffs off which aren't even gold handcuffs and outpatient they're co co copper or penny handcuffs and try to get yourself some golden handcuffs in the, in the meantime, right? So at least get your income up. That's one thing I think that differs differentiates myself from a lot of other people in this space is that I've actually helped, you know, a thousand plus PTs earn a hundred K or more. So when people come to me whining, like, oh, I can't start a business because of my job, it's let's get you a hundred K job first. So you have some capital on the line so you can actually go on and be, be, make smart financial decisions, right? Building on that about strategies for that transition period from the better performing, more successful people that have had a smooth transition, very few of them have been able to do it straight out of a very busy out, very demanding outpatient job. Most have had success in a hospital or skilled nursing facility setting where maybe they could drop to four tens or go to home health. And that gives you a little more time and flexibility as you transition to building your business. If you're working five, 10 hour days and then doing notes at nighttime on your own in that shitty outpatient job, then that's going to be a really hard, you're not going to have a lot of energy or time to work on building your escape route. Back to the point of this podcast today, which is that you, know, you didn't have $18,000 in revenue in 11 weeks. I want to ask you first your initial challenges. So what are some of the biggest challenges you face in the first few weeks of starting practice? 
Yeah. So just previewing. So last September was when I was like, all right, screw this. I'm going on my own. I knew because of taxes, I was going to wait till January. So in December is when I filled out my paperwork with a January start date. So I formed my LLC, did my business bank account, set up my Stripe account. Those are the first three things that you have to do when you make a business is LLC. I use Zen Business. It was super easy. It cost me like, I don't know, $200. They did my operating agreement. They sent me my EIN for the IRS for tax purposes. And then I took that, those documents they gave me to the bank. I opened a business checking account. And then I went on Stripe and I made a Stripe account. All of those things were all done in two weeks or less. So you can do those very quickly. They don't take a lot of time, not a lot of money. And I started that and knowing that I would eventually do my own thing for purposes of finance, loans, business, credit cards, those kind of things. They would like for your business to be about six months old and hopefully you have ran 50,000 of revenue through that LLC before you start to apply for those things. If you're even slightly interested in potentially doing your own thing, I would go ahead and start those things now so that they can bake in the background like a crock pot. So then when you start to do your own thing, you already have this money. Another hack is also really quickly, really quickly anything that you're paying for that, the LLC, the legal stuff, that's actually tax deductible against your income. So yeah, it's money off the gate initially. And we usually tell you guys to sell something first before you do that, but it's actually really good advice to just do that now if you're listening to this, if you're unsure, because if you come to work with us in any capacity and you're like, oh, but I don't have my LLC, you like, well, did you listen to the podcast? Yeah. And then furthermore, if you have a PRN job or a job and you can get your job to pay your LLC as a 1099 instead of paying you personally, then that just counts as more income going through your business. So then when you start to start to make moves in the future, you already have this cycle of money going through the LLC, through the business checking account. And that just helps smooth some of the startup process, especially when your next step is then transitioning to finding a space. My biggest challenge in the first few weeks was, am I going to stay mobile? and go to where my clients are, or am I going to try to find a place and have clients come to me? Uh, a lot of people do the mobile thing for a little while, and then they find a place, but going mobile is very inefficient. Cause you think about if you have a, an hour session, you spend 30 minutes driving there, do the hour session and 30 minutes leaving, that was two hours. So if you're trying to make $200 an hour, you'd have to charge $100 for that one hour session, which could work, but a little bit of a harder sell. So just for efficiency, I said, hey, you know what? I'm going to find a place right away so then I can just be more efficient with my time and, um, having people come to me. So as I was thinking about finding a space, the top two things that I started to do was I just started posting and asking people, hey, does anyone know a gym owner that has a room that I could potentially rent or even someone with a corner where I can set up a table? <laughs> The advantage of setting up inside of a gym or already established business is that you don't have to buy any equipment. So that again, lowers upfront costs. So that's what I was looking for initially. And you already have a warm client base. If you have people that come and go to the gym and they see you, then that's going to be an opportunity for conversation and potential clients. So I started asking around and there weren't a lot of opportunities where I am. But that's okay. Cause again, we moved here last year. I didn't know a lot of people. And so to help me meet more people, that's when I joined a business group. So of course the most popular big one is BGNI business networking incorporated business networking international. I don't know. It's BNI. It's a business networking C specific group. So basically every little subgroup, you can only have one of a particular person. It'll be like one lawyer, one chiropractor, one physical therapist, one roofer, one plumber, et cetera. Physical therapists don't really join networking groups. So you pretty much have a clear path to joining any networking group. And by going to that networking group, it helped me establish relationships with other business owners in the community. And I was able to make my ask, hey, does anyone know anyone might be renting a room? 
And so through those connections, I got uh, linked up with this very cool um, pediatric and prenatal chiropractor uh, by our house. And she had a room for rent that I was able to move into for $800 a month, all included um, utilities, internet, cleaning. And she was able to sign me on a month lease with no security deposit. So when I reached the point where maybe I'm having a little more revenue, a little more clients that need to transition to a larger space, I'll have that opportunity. To recap, understand starting off, you can use simple things to get to LLC first. One thing he didn't mention that I will mention is that if you are going to mention yourself on payroll, you may want to go through something that, or pay for something that does allow you to have corporation compliance to register like unemployment and stuff in your state if you're going to be paying yourself on payroll. That's just something we've dealt with, but it's a bit different for myself because we registered our LLC in Wyoming. And because we pay employees like myself and my wife in Arizona, we actually have to register through Arizona Unemployment. That's way more advanced. Don't worry about that now. But it is something where you just want to be aware of that. So covering the beginning part there, you're going to focus on legal first. Make sure you're completely compliant. It'll make your life easier, as Tom has talked about. As far as getting clients, and really this is a point of contention with a lot of our beginners that come through the DVD Preneur program, is that they will whine that they don't have leads or clients, but are they talking to anybody like you're talking to anybody, Thomas? Maybe they don't know how, but a lot of them aren't talking, right? They're not talking to anyone. And yeah, this has happened time and time again, where we've had people be like, oh, well, I'm not making any money. How many people do you talk to? No one. I want you guys to be aware that nobody cares about your business more than you, right? Tom cares about his family more than his job, but he knows he needs to replace, he, need, he, he, he needs to replace that job to provide for his family and get more of his time back. That's one of these things where he had the experience of his dad dying. He had the experience of being successful in real estate before PT school. If you're sitting here listening to this and be like, oh, wow. Well, I don't know if I can ask people. I don't know if I can join a BNI group. A lot of you guys have been in communities, hometowns for years. Thomas was only in the Clearwater, Florida area for one year. And he was able to talk to people, get a space to rent, set up LLC, make money, and still escape that bad situation he was in where even though he was making a decent amount of money, he didn't have the time he needed to be there for his family. So I want you to really understand when it comes to what he's talking about, a lot of times it's just getting out of your comfort zone. And Thomas, is there anything that you felt uncomfortable doing at first that you want to share? Yeah. So just being new, being a new business owner, going to this business networking group with very established business owners, we're talking realtors, lawyers, plumbers, general contractors, like these people own like legit big businesses. And I was a little bit nervous about I'm coming in here with zero dollars one weekend. What I found is that actually they had all started in my position. So everyone there has been extremely accommodating and extremely supportive. And I'd say half of my referrals have come from that group. Because the way that these specific business groups work is that you have to do one-on-one -on -one meetings with the other members and you have to give referrals to the other members by me saying, hey, I help people with back pain. I help people with shoulder pain. I help people with knee pain. Then all of those people are able to send me clients and they're able to check their box on their uh, networking like app. And then it also gives me the opportunity to potentially get a new client. Best case, I get a new client. Worst case, I can get a review or potentially a referral of who else do you know that may benefit services that I have to offer. So it's that's really been the biggest thing that gave me a boost initially that I was a little nervous about, but that has already paid for itself <laughs> in the first month that already paid for it, the membership for the year. That's tax deductible as well. Yep. 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 Tax deductible. So we, yep. So we went through the background, the motivation, some initial challenges. I want to go through the goal setting and planning your strategy and execution. Did you set any specific financial or business goals when you started, such as reaching $18,000 in 11 weeks? Yes. My goal is to get over 20K in top line revenue in the first six months or monthly top line revenue with a 10% profitability in the first six months. So that's my goal that I am aiming for. I knew I could get over 10K pretty quick. 
because if you're selling $2,000 packages, you only need five sales to hit that. And so that's a pretty reasonable mark to hit pretty quickly. So those were my getting to 10 K within the first three months and then getting to 20 K in the first six months, is my goal. Second question, and we are going to be biased because you are a DP and you're a team member, but how did you plan your marketing and outreach strategy to attract your <laughs> initial clients? Marketing and strategy and advertising and sales and converting. Those are all the extremely important parts of your business, but none of them matter if nobody knows that you even are a human that exists much more that you have a business, much more that you solve problems. So usually you have to start farther upstream with marketing, adver marketing, advertising, talking to people first, and then you can work on coming back or finding some of the other skills in your pipeline. So big picture, you got to make people aware that you have a thing and that you solve problems and that you are a physical therapist. Then you have to get them to on the phone or in the clinic, and then you have to get them to buy something from you. And then you have to get them to actually show up and do the work to get the result. Those four layers there. So on the advertising marketing side, because it's just me, I'm just one person and I don't have a lot of revenue to pay somebody else. I needed to leverage technology and systems to make each of these steps as efficient as possible. So using ACRM, I'm biased towards the entrepreneur platform because that's, that's what I've been using for over a year now, helping everybody out. But you have to have, you have to be able to email your clients or leads. You'd be able to text your clients and leads. You have to be able to have calendars to be able to do Zoom calls or phone calls. You have to be able to have appointment reminders. You have to be able to do all those things. And the more automatic you can make them, then the more of your time that you are able to save. A quick question. So using our entrepreneur systems compared to people that come to us and say, oh, I don't have a website yet. Can you elaborate on why you don't actually need a website first? Or you can use your phone by yourself or just use our systems without even having a website ready to basically generate leads and sell? Yeah. So the idea of having a website is a little bit of a dot com boom, 90s, 2000 boomer mindset that, oh my God, the first thing you have to do, you have to print business cards, you have to get shirts and you have to build a website, right? But all three of those things actually have nothing to do with letting people know about your stuff, the problems that you solve or getting them to give you money. Spending hours and hours designing the perfect business card and getting it printed is not going to that's not going to do anything. Making shirts, like I still haven't even gotten shirts ordered. I'm three months in. Okay. I don't have shirts. I don't need shirts. Okay. And then three, we're going to buy a website. You don't need a website. All you need is a way for you to contact the person. So if you are with a person, someone says, this is what I did for the first two months. People, I would be at the gym or out in the community or at my business group. And someone will say, Hey, do you have a bit? Do you have a card? I said, oh, I don't have my cards yet, but what's your phone number? I would get their phone number, put it in my phone, and I would text them right away. Hey, this is Dr. Tommy from Extra Mile Rehab and Performance. And what's your name? Then I'll put their name in my phone. So then I have a way to contact them. Of course, I put it in the DHCpreneur system as well, but that's an easy hack. Even if you do have business cards, you might even say, like, oh, I don't have a card on me right now. Oh, what's your phone number? Because then you can contact them. How many of us have taken a business card and then you never use it? You never call the person, you never text the person, you'll lose the card, right? I know I'm guilty of that. So when you're talking to someone, getting their info and texting them first is, that's a huge hack to be able to get contact first. And as far as not needing a website, the purpose of a website is to get someone, to start a conversation with someone. And so inside of, the DBTpreneur platform, we have these things called funnels and all the funnel is it's just one page with a button or a form where you put in your name, your email, your phone number, or you click schedule a phone call or something like that. And it has the thank you page. That's all you need to start because the, when someone goes to a website, the less things they can click on, the more likely they are to actually do the thing you're asking them to do. 
So if you go to a website and at the top it says home, about, hours, services, contact us, FAQ. Someone might go on that side, they might click around and then leave. And you, you can't contact them because you don't have their email or phone number. But if someone goes to one page and it says, schedule your discovery call, get your free back pain assessment. And it's name, email, sub, get button with get my assessment. You're way more likely to get that person's information. Also with our systems, we're pretty good and probably the best agency in this space because I know we just onboarded about 15, be 15 beginners. We got them all phone numbers and HIPAA compliance and federal law compliance within 14 days or less. Actually, Tommy did that. And it's something where email marketing is good, but people respond better to text. And that's one of these things where we've seen people come to us with nothing, get a funnel that links to a calendar and a text and all these things. And they're able to text these leads that come in automatically from the funnels. They can put the funnels on their websites too, they already have one. But the people that just have websites, again, as Tommy said, that's more of the dot com boomer mindset. And yeah, you can build a website if you really want it and need it, if you feel like you, if you absolutely need it, but it's going to hold yourself back from just talking to people and selling it and growing. And I think that's what separates us from a lot of other people is not only do we give you systems, we teach how to use the systems and the method of, of contact. And I think because Thomas has worked so much within our systems, it became way easier for you just to start as a background compared to you just starting by yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And so just to be clear, as a new business owner, time is not on my side. Time is working against me. So I have to be super laser focused on asking myself, this activity or project that I'm working on, how is this tied directly to getting more dollars? If there is not a very clear connection, I can't waste my time on it. I can't spend five hours building a website when I could spend five hours making content, messaging people on Instagram, calling businesses, going out in the community and meeting more people. That's a better use of my time to translate, more likely to translate to dollars. Does that yeah. kind of make sense? Yeah, and also I wanna to touch on that. We have people come to us that pay three to five grand for a website and our systems that actually start as low as $200 a month and have done more for them than the three to five grand they paid because they had that mindset and they were sold into this outdated price and model. I'm gonna tell you from my personal experiences, when I work with any business coach, they don't have a DPT. They're usually not relatable to the younger audience, especially with student loans or anything like that. If they're a foreign business coach, they have no idea how the American economy works. And so just be aware of who you're listening to and they actually understand your problem. Tommy and I are both DPTs, right? We both had six figure or have six figure student loan debt, right? And it's something where we understand more and why you have to have that motivation there, right? Now, if you don't have that, you're cushy, you might not be motivated, right? But as Tommy was saying, Speed's always going to win. It's one of these things where I want you to understand, and I'll take this as a quote actually from Tate, when he said, but when a rocket's flying out of the atmosphere, it doesn't fucking pause, does it, right? So understand that if you want to get out of where you're at and grow that business, you just have to be consistent and just grind. Even if you're not seeing results at first, just grind. It will eventually pay off. But we have to be smart financially and time wise. Referring back on the time, because time is not on your side and you don't have a lot of money to put into things. Um, I, the Alex Ramosi's book, Hundred Million Dollar Leads, is an excellent read for anyone just starting out because it really makes it very simple. There's only four ways to let people know about your stuff: is one on one to a warm audience of people to know you. So that would be referrals, messaging your friends and phone on Instagram, messaging people in your contact, texting people, hey, do you know anyone I can work with? One-on-one -on -one cold outreach, which would be cold out email, buying a list. We don't really do that in the PT space, so that one's already knocked out. The third one is one to many warm. That's gonna be content. That's gonna be making content and valuable things to people that already follow you and are in your network. That's gonna be if you're out in the community networking and you're doing a presentation to a group, that's gonna be that one to many. And then the one to many cold is gonna be paid ads. Initially, when you're starting, we do not recommend running paid ads until you're crossing for that 20K in revenue because you want to have all the other pieces of your pipeline. 
being able to convert people to come to the clinic. Once they come to the clinic, sell them into a package. You have to have those skills ironed out, locked in before you start to run paid ads. Because if you don't have these other pieces in place, you're burning money. Because if I send you 100, quali 100 qualified leads, see all the ads, I send you 100 qualified leads, but you don't have any skills to follow up, you have a system to follow up, they come to the clinic and nobody buys anything, you just wasted a bunch of money. So we like for our clients to cross that 20K revenue threshold before we start having that conversation of that paid ads. But out of those four, your two main options are warm reach outs for referrals, people going out in the community, shaking hands, and then content. And those are the two that I have spent most of my effort on is content, making reels, making shorts, making blog posts, making posts in groups here in my local area, like the Dunedin group, Palm Harbor group. And I make posts about who's having back pain or who's having shoulder pain or whatever. Just all those free options are what I'm sticking with because I don't have a lot of money right now. So I was going to ask you about client acquisition, but you covered that. But one question on that though, is if you did any special questions, offers or strategies outside of what you already mentioned to build your client base quickly. Yeah. So what I'm doing right now is on the front end. So our most successful clients, how they structure it is you meet someone out in the community or a Facebook message or whatever, and maybe you do a free 15 minute discovery phone call, Zoom call, meet them for coffee. I don't know, like a fit, they come to the clinic, whatever, a 15 minute kind of free thing. And then you convert them into a 45 to one hour paid thing. This could be your consultation, your evaluation. That's anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour, 79 to $97 price point. And then off of that conversation where you're clarifying that they have a problem, you have the solution and they want to work with you and use your solution to fix their problem and they have the money to pay for it. Then you sell them that package or that plan to help them solve their problem. I have structured it a little bit differently where my free and first visit are rolled into one. So for someone that is a warm referral, I bring them in on a complimentary session. Uh, tactically, there's different ways to do it. Way number one is you can say, hey, this is a complimentary session. They come in and then you say, hey, like, you go through a whole eval for 45 minutes, an hour, whatever, and then you try to sell them to a package off of that complimentary visit. Or the second way that you do it is you collect a card on file as a deposit on that visit. Because if people give you their credit card when they schedule, they're way more likely to show up and it shows intent to purchase. So if someone gives you their credit card, they're 67% more likely to buy something from you again. So you can have them give you a $100 deposit to hold their spot. And you tell them on the phone, you come in, see what's going on. If you want to work with us, we'll apply that $100 towards whatever plan that we make together. Or if we suck or you think I suck, we'll refund you your $100 and you'll be on your way. So that's a little bit different way to tactically pre-frame like a complimentary like deposit that either roll into a package or into a refund, but you still get that money, you get that intent to purchase. It's a little bit less risky. It just depends on which strategy you want to use. How did you determine your pricing structure? So what you do for pricing is you take whatever price you're charging to visit, you divide it by three, and that's ballpark what you can afford to pay yourself. So for me, I was making 63, basically $63 an hour in home health times that by three, that's $190. I knew that I needed to be north of $190 or I should just go back to home health. We tell our clients across the board, $200 and up is the ballpark you should be at for that reason. Because when you're a business owner, you collect your revenue, then you've all your taxes, operating expenses, marketing, your systems, all your equipment, all this stuff. And then you have your payroll that you can actually take home as payroll and profit. Usually it's about... 30 to 40% is what you're actually able to take home. And so if you're charged under than 200, 
you should probably just go get a home health job because you're actually going to get more money in your bank account at the end of the year. If you're convicted and you think you're actually providing value, you need to be north of 200 to actually be a profitable business. Yeah, we see a lot of people on Instagram, rolling cash practices, you click on their rates and 140 and it's like, you're a fucking idiot. So if that's you, that's how we feel about you. Next yeah, question. Yeah, think about it. If, if you're trying to $150, dude, I was talking to a person here in my community. He's a cash pay mobile. He's charged us $60 for a half hour or $110 for an hour driving to people's houses. So he's been in half an hour driving to someone's house, being there for an hour, half an hour back for $120. So he's working for $60 an hour as a business. So if we divide that by three, he's really taking all the $20 an hour. I want you guys to understand that we've gone to, or I've gone to myofascial massage therapist who charged $300 a session or 150 and up. So there's no reason for you guys to be charging less than 200 because there's people with less credentials out here charging a lot more, but also with the economy, inflation, and just for, for business growth, you need to charge at least $200. We have trainings on this YouTube and the podcast that we've gone over this multiple times. Or if you're on the Revenue Accelerator Challenge where we taught for 12 hours for free that week, we covered why you need to be on there. That's one of these things, though, where it's okay to do, you know, introductory offers at like 90 but for true treatments, you can't be dicking around and you can't be really building yourself like each driving around for $60. That just shows a lack of reference for business at scale. And I think that's where we've replaced a lot of thinking for people that were solopreneurs instead of entrepreneurs and people don't understand how to run a business at scale because people didn't teach each other to do it. A lot of people didn't teach each other to run a business yeah. at scale. And if you're doing what we're saying and I'm saying you're a fucking idiot. Don't take it personally. It's more that somebody needs to tell you. And if I'm the one who needs to tell you that you're being stupid, hopefully it's a wake up call for you to at least change your rates, right? Whether you work with us or not, at least you'll make more money by just listening to this episode and considering it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Because the whole point of you starting your own clinic is to play the time game to eventually get back your time. By charging appropriately and having enough revenue, going to allow you to do more things like run paid ads to get more leads. It's going to allow you to invest in your systems to make them better. It's going to allow you to bring up other team members and pay them appropriately to help build the business. So you have to be able to, you have to be able to pay someone else to deliver the service, and there's still be enough profit for the business to continue. So if you charge a hundred dollars a session but it costs $100 a session to deliver the service, the service, then there's zero profit. We charge 200 and I can pay, uh, you know, fill the PT $75 an hour or whatever. You charge $200 and then I pay another PT $75 an hour to deliver on that service. Then the business still gets to keep 125, pay taxes, pay operating ex expense, maybe do marketing. And so that's the key. That's how you buy back your time of someone else delivering the service, but it can used to be profitable. And that's one thing too I want to mention. We've seen this happen because it is kind of just a problem in the physical therapy space right now. We've seen some people that have nothing and they've sold into a 5K a month coaching program, maybe a 5K, six week, eight week coaching program. And what happens is when they get sold into it, they're told that all their dreams are going to come true. But then we talk to them usually after they've gone through these programs and guess what? Now they have five to $6,000 in credit card debt and they don't have a business or they're charging less. And that's something where they're like, oh, but I signed the contract. And okay, it doesn't matter. It's not like you signed a contract to serve in the United States military. If you signed that contract, but you got to stay with that contract. For these other contracts that you've signed, a lot of them aren't FTC compliant. And that's one of these things where I want to just mention this because we've seen people really get hurt uh, financially. And it's something where, why we keep our rates a bit lower and why we try to find some value even for free on the podcast and the YouTube is we've seen people get burned from thousands of dollars and not even be told what we're teaching you on this podcast right now. And I want to make sure that it is tax deductible, but if your business is, is at a negative, you're not going to get ahead at all, right? You're not in business to break even. You're in business to make money. That's why we differentiate revenue versus profit, right? A lot of people say, 
hey, you know, I was guilty of this when I was younger in business. I made 40K in a week. I wasn't 40K in profit. There was a lot of profit because it was an online course, but it's still going to be one of these things where when Tommy's talking about the 16K in 11 weeks, it's, it's a revenue, not profit. But if you are paying two to 5K a month for mastermind coaching programs and you feel like you're not getting what you're paying for, you can always get it out through breach of contract. But we've seen that be the number one thing that eats up revenue. Jake, who is our CMO, we did build a calculator for this and we went through the calculator. We saw that some people that were paying like $2,100 a month for a coaching program or something like that. What ended up happening is that all their profit was gone, even once their business started to become profitable because the coaching program was eating the revenue. All right. And I'm saying not anti coaching, I've been through a lot of coaching myself. We want to make sure that you're not being stupid on it. Yeah, you see it a lot. Well, be, people just don't, people don't understand how much money you actually have to make to actually make a profit like in your bank account. Because you can do spreadsheet math all day, but it doesn't matter. It's what's actually going in your bank account. That's your real money. And so I learned this in real estate for sure. Because last year we collected $75,000 in rent on our properties. And it's like, oh, wow, that's cool. It's like, okay, we probably have $5,000 in profit. Because it's like, we'd get a new roof. We'd get a new AC. We'd get a new water heater. We had to evict a tenant. They didn't pay for like three months. We had all these mortgages. And so like, I already knew that on the front end. So it's like, you have to make so much more money than you think. And then if you think that you're going to hire someone to help you, you have to make so much more money to then pay for that person coming in. I that would be very, you, very... I'm what? Say, I, see, I see why you flabbergasted your peak school business professors with these analyses. Yeah. And so you have to be... And one thing you have to be really careful of, everybody always wants their first hire to be like an admin person, an admin front desk person to take calls or send messages or do whatever front desk admin people do. I'll be very careful because that person is only going to be an expense. They don't drive revenue. Whereas hiring another PT is going to actually be able to sell something that gives the business revenue. And they can go do marketing, make content, follow up with leads. They can do all the things that business needs to do. So you have to be careful hiring staff that does not bring in revenue because that's a huge drag on your expense and profit. Last question here, because we can obviously go through this, make sure we cover it all. We covered your background motivation. We covered your initial challenges. We covered strategy and execution, goal setting and planning, acquisition, positioning. Mindset and resilience, for sure. We can add more on that if you want. Adaptation and learning. Key takeaways we'll go through in a second. My last question on the general gist of this, though, is about your sales process. Can you walk us through your sales process and how did you convert potential clients into paying customers? Did you use any specific techniques or approaches that you, you think make a, made a difference? Yes. So when we're thinking about what kinds of clients are coming in the door, there's people that know you a little bit, the people that don't know you at all, and the people that know you very well. So if my mother-in-law's neighbor comes in to see me, it's probably going to be a pretty easy sale. I don't have to be a very good salesman. I just have to be nice and listen, and I'm probably going to be able to close that sale. Someone that just got my phone number or saw a video or... They're, they saw my business card, my flyer, and they're calling me and they literally don't know who I am. That's going to be a much, much harder sale because I have to build a lot of trust. I have to build a bridge of trust and the dollar can come across the, the bridge of trust. And so for colder leads, you have to do more work between them showing interest and them actually coming to the clinic. So this is where the systems and the automations can really help. You have to put, you have to provide a lot of value that has to be very fast because you can think of it like an ice cube. You take the ice cube out the freezer and you put it on the plate and it starts melting right away. So if someone sends you a DM, they send you an email, they send you a text, they call the office, they call your phone, you have to follow up with them so fast to start that trust building process. And then you can email them, hey, he, he, here's a guide about me. Here's a guide about our clinic. Here's a tour of our office. Here's some frequently asked questions. 
here's some YouTube videos about back pain or shoulder pain or knee pain. So the more things that you can provide to them and communicate with them before they come into the clinic, that's going to increase your ability to convert and sell to that client because they already have an understanding of who you are, what you do, all that kind of thing. The other thing that's super practical is using an EMR so you can send them their paperwork um, ahead of time before they come to the clinic. Because then that gives you more time talking to them one-on-one -on -one in the clinic instead of them wasting 15, 20 minutes doing paperwork. And then your 45 minutes just got cut to 10 minutes. So if it's someone that doesn't know you, very hard to build a relationship, figure out what's going on, sell to them in 10 minutes. I use Intake Q. A lot of our clients love using Jane. Both of them have the ability to get someone's email, send them the paperwork ahead of time. They fill it out. You can review it. Then when they come in, you say, hey, you know, oh, I saw you fill out your paperwork. It looks like we've had this and this. We have these medications. We have these allergies. These are your concerns. Is there anything that I missed here? Then you're accelerating the evaluation process. So you can really get to know that person, what's important for them, then that's going to lead to that sales process. So I'd say having the systems to give more contact points and more value before they come to the office and sending them their paperwork before they come to the office are probably the top two, like very tactical things. Yeah, one thing you mentioned in marketing is going to speed to lead. And that's something with our systems, which is pretty nice. I know with our client, Joey, and actually even, even Nick, both of them have messaged me saying that they've saved hundreds of hours using our phone numbers because what happens is if they're with a client treating, they're both solo bash solo cash based practitioners but i got a message from nick the other day because when people call his number through us and they text him immediately immediately hi this is a chief physical therapy sorry i can't reach you what happens is because that's so fast people even though it's automated people like that they're being responded to and feel cared about Another thing we have is our bot nick's i think our only client that's really trained bot pretty well where it can answer specific questions about power listing and things like that oh we do have AI bots as well that can basically replicate you, but they are a bit harder to use. And the reason I say that is because Nick's done really well with it, but he was one of our initial clients. We had a long time to train it, where someone else was begging for the bot and then we gave it to him. And he's like, there's too many people talking to my bot. And we turned it off. We don't give that bot to everybody, but speed to lead is a huge marketing win. All right now, wrapping up the podcast here, looking back, what are the three biggest factors that contributed to your success in making $18,000 in 11 weeks? Focusing on the inputs and not the revenue. So what work and action need to be completed and staying very focused on that. For me specifically, it's going to my networking group, meeting as many of those people, going out in the community, meeting other business owners that may have people that would be interested in my services and making content, making lots and lots of content that increases the awareness, people knowing that I exist and that I have solutions to their problems. Are there any mistakes or lessons that you wish you had known from the beginning? One of the biggest lessons that I had to figure out is that no one cares that I'm a doctor of physical therapy. When I graduated school, they were like, oh, you're a doctor of physical therapy. It's great. Everyone's just going to line up and just bow down to you because you have the solution to their problems. And that is 100% false. The only thing people care about is themselves. So you have to get very clear on what their problem is, what your solution is, and that your solution is going to solve their problem. That is not complicated in your content, your advertising, your nurture, your in-person conversations, the structure of your packages, you will lose the client. So if someone comes in, so if someone comes in, you have to get off of, I have back pain, I have shoulder pain, I have knee pain. You have to learn how to ask questions and go deeper than those surface level responses. So someone comes in and says, I have knee pain. You say, how is that affecting you? I have knee pain and it makes it hard to do stairs. Okay. And do you, where do you have to do stairs? It's affecting your work or your family. Oh, this is affecting my family because my mom, she lives upstairs and I take care of my mom. Okay. And why is it important to take care of your mom? I take care of my mom because my dad died and. So we went down the journey from my knee hurts all the way down to, I want to be a good son and take care of my mom. That is a much better problem that then you can position your solution to, 
hey, we're going to go through the program. We're going to help you meet all your goals. That way that you can get feeling better. So the stairs are not a problem. You're able to really be there for your mom and your family the way that you want to. And then that smoothly goes into when you start to present an offer or a solution to their problem. So you have to ask enough questions so you get all the way down to the why. Why are they here? Why do they care that they have back pain? Man, I have back pain. I can't lean over and pick up my kid. So I feel like a bad mom. I have uh, shoulder pain, so I can't go to CrossFit. All my friends are at CrossFit and my shoulder hurts and I go there and I feel embarrassed because I can't do the movement. So I just haven't been showing up. And now my nutrition's thing and I'm drinking, now I'm gaining weight. Okay, those are much better conversations. You're way more likely to convert and work with that client if you get to that level of conversation. Have nothing to do with your letters or title or anything. You could be a personal trainer or a stretch coach and they will still pay you because you're listening and you have the solution to their problem. For your future plans, what are your plans moving forward and how do you plan to sustain or grow beyond the initial success? So right now, my initial goal was to cross 10K in top line revenue in the first three months, which we have met. And my next goal is going to be crossing 20K revenue in the next six months. But focusing on revenue is not the correct thing. I have to focus on the work. So I need to be doing about five to 10 community networking workshop, meeting other gym owners in the community a month. I need to be posting content for me. I try to post short form content every single day. I'd like to have a longer form content, maybe once a week. And any leads that come in, I have to follow up with them at the minimum same day, ideally within the hour. So those are the three things that I'm being very focused and intentional on to help sustain some of this momentum. And then if you haven't covered it already, is there any other advice you would give to other physical therapists considering a cash-based model? If you are considering a cash-based model, you have to have your mindset opened up. As physical therapists, most of us are struggling paycheck to paycheck with huge student loans. And if that is the position that you're in, when you go to sell someone or you go to ask for money, you feel very uncomfortable because you're selling out of your own pocket. You're saying, dude, I couldn't afford a $2,000 package. There's no way anyone else would afford a $2,000 package. And that is a very self-limiting belief. And it's very challenging to break that mindset. One of the easiest things is to find some premium in your area, whether it is a massage therapist, a cafe physical therapist, chiropractor, stretch coat, whatever. Find something and go experience it for yourself. And you'll be able to have the realization, wow, if they're doing this and get $50, then I can do this and get 200, no problem. And so usually going out and having those experiences with other businesses and other operations helps break that self-limiting belief. For the closing questions. What's one piece of advice you would give to someone just starting in the cash-based PT practice who just listened to this? or the thing you want to take away the most from what we just covered? If you just started a cash pay practice, don't get distracted on things that do not directly tie to getting money. If it's not getting you more clients or getting you in front of more people or helping you convert more people to more money, then you should not be focusing on it. And so making that very clear line in the sand early on is gonna help you because at the beginning, you don't have time you have limited time that you can't waste on activities that don't tie to revenue. So things like making shirts, building a website, getting business cards, doing all those things don't directly tie to revenue. You need to talk to more people, make more content, go network with owners, go where your target audience is. And those things are more likely to lead to dollars. How can our listeners connect with you or learn more about your journey? Yeah, if you'd like to connect with me, of course, I'm part of the DPTpreneur team. If you message any of the DPTpreneur pages, I'm on there. My specific Instagram is uh, extra mile rehab underscore Tommy V. 
you can find me on there. Well, I'm sure we'll be linking it in the show notes and everything. Um, yeah, I'm easy to find. 